Good afternoon or good morning for folks at the West Coast. Welcome to another QB Power Hour. My name is Hector Garcia, and today we're going to talk about the firm of the future business model. And we have a very special guest speaker, Ron Baker. Uh, we also have Chris Repetto from Intuit. <clears throat> Michelle is going to jump in uh, briefly because she's actually uh, doing a QuickBooks online training in uh in Boston today. So she's going to sneak out of the training for a little bit and jump in and, and talk a little bit about um, the the rates. So it's going to be mostly me, Chris, and, and Ron today. Anyway, let me go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, about QB Power Hour. So we're a webinar series every two weeks. Now, although that in the past month or so, or for the next month, we're actually doing a weekly just because we have a lot of content, a lot of demand for content, uh, it being you know the fall and everything. And the next one's gonna be actually next week. Uh, we're gonna do what's new QuickBooks 2016. And that's based on the speculation that uh, on, sep on September 8th, this software will be released, but this is still kind of speculation because it doesn't, we don't know until it actually happens. So we're hoping that it will be released uh, next week, and if it is, we'll have it. Um, if it's not, then we'll we'll change another topic or 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 move it around. So we will definitely not release any new features until Intuit says it's okay to do so. Anyway, uh, we usually talk about tips and tricks and advanced insights on how to use QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop. That's kind of our 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 core. However, from time to time, we have special guests where we talk about third-party apps, we'll talk about practice management, we'll talk about industry-related news with accounting and, and, and small business. So that's mostly what we do. Today, we'll talk about <clears throat> QB Power Hour, which we just did, and we'll introduce myself and Michelle, talk about the CPE process, go over announcements, and the learning objectives and the topics are Chris Repetto from Intuit, he's, his webcam is on, so he can say hi. Um, he's going to talk about... Um, you know, uh, he's going to make a big, huge announcement, right? And actually, I'm very, very proud and happy and ecstatic that he's making this type of announcement um, in, in our in our uh, QB Power Hour because uh, it obviously is one of the, the the fun parts of the conference that a lot of us are going to go to uh, about QuickBooks Connect. And Michelle Long will talk about some some great findings about the average rate survey that she did with, with Intuit. So you'll, we'll get some insights about um, wh what the average rate of accounting services are. Our feature speaker is Ron Baker. He'll talk about his vision for Firm of the Future, which is similar uh, than Intuit. And, and, and Chris Repetto will talk about it real quick, but but he will talk more about the business model part. And then um, we have a sponsor uh, for this episode. It's Practice Initian. We were going to have a demo uh, today, but unfortunately, I wanted to have more time with Ron Baker. So we'll quickly talk about Practice Ignition, and we're actually going to schedule them to do a full demo of their of their app um, in a couple of weeks, actually uh, on October 15th. So Michelle Long, um, she's the author of numerous QuickBooks books. She runs the, the biggest web-based uh, QuickBooks consulting group through LinkedIn. Check it out. It has more than 150,000 members, and she's a national and international speaker for Intuit. Myself, I'm a CPA, live and work in Miami, Florida. I do QuickBooks training, mostly for living clients, other bookkeepers. Um, and I'm happy to be here. CPE process, you need to be watching the episode live. You need to attend the webinar live. You need to answer the CPE question correctly when it comes out towards the end of the webinar. And you have to write down the password, which will be somewhere in the middle of the webinar. And please allow uh, three weeks for them to be emailed. Okay, upcoming events. Uh, QuickBooks, uh, together with Wooded Events, is putting together the annual QuickBooks virtual conference. It's 100% free. It's two days back to back September 16th and 17th, right after um, extension tax season. So check it out, quickbooksvcon.com. Now the real, what I like to call the real QuickBooks conference, QuickBooks Connect in San Jose in November. Chris Repetto will talk about that when he when he, when it's his chance, he'll talk about it again. Uh, then, then after there's LeaderCon on November 16th and 19th, and we're gonna do QB Power Hour live in front of a live audience. So we'll kind of explain to people what the process of running a webinar is like, and we'll actually have one there. So it should be a lot of fun. We've never done that before. And um, Michelle and I actually got selected to go on tour again, and we're gonna go to Syracuse, New York City, and Long Island uh, in the first week of October. So check it out in intuitacademy.com. So towards the end of the webinar, I'll talk about practice ignition, which we're gonna do a full demo on. And, and, I, and I like 
linked to this topic because practice ignition is all about client onboarding and proposal and engagement automation, which is a really important piece of taking your practice to the future. So without further ado, I'll have uh, Chris Ruppetto from Intuit uh, jump in, unless Michelle is connected. I don't think she's connected yet. So Chris, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Hector. Um, so, you know, wanted to, uh, you, know, you mentioned Firm of the Future and, and wanted to talk about Intuit's perspective on that and, and we're working with Ron and, and a lot of industry leaders on helping firms get future ready today. And, and by that, we mean there's three basic components. And we know that there's a lot of companies, a lot of influencers out there talking about uh, getting future ready or, or, you know, showing the warning signs of, hey, you know, you've got to get on top of the latest technology in order just to simply be in business five years from now and to stay competitive and to attract small business clients that are expecting you to be available 24-7 and have a mobile uh, component and uh, you know not say things like, I'll get back to you, I'll answer that question when I get back to the office on Monday. Um, so the way that we think about it is, is you know, first thing is you, know, you have to move to the cloud. We support our desktop clients. We have millions of QuickBooks desktop clients. We will never not support QuickBooks Desktop, let me go on record by saying that, as long as our clients are there, as, as long as we have customers on that product. It's a great product. We improve it every year. But we know that the future is online. You look at any technology. Look, look at your smartphone and how often you use it. Um, that's where the future is going. We know that QuickBooks Online is growing faster than desktop as far as new customer usage. Migrations from desktop to online are, are uh, exceeding quarter over quarter. So we know that's where the future is, and that's where... We're going to invest and make sure that our online and mobile offerings are, are as good as, as anyone out there, if not better. And so, you know, trying moving a client to QBO, trying the cloud, seeing the efficiency, seeing how much more you can, better you can collaborate with your clients, and just see uh, how much better experience it is than, than uh, what you're currently using. And then, you know, the second part is uh, becoming that trusted advisor and being paid for it. And this is where Ron can talk more specifically about it. But you know, the way we think about it is you're, you're so much more efficient by using the cloud and, and services like that, that billing by the hour just doesn't make a whole lot of sense anymore. And in order to make the same amount of money per client, you're going to have to have 10, 20, 50 more clients because you're doing things in 10 minutes that used to take an hour. So moving to that value pricing model where you're getting paid for the advisory services, for the services you provide to the clients, and not uh, being paid uh, for how long it takes you doesn't seem to make a lot of sense anymore. Plus, the small businesses, we know, like that fact that they know exactly how much they're going to be charged each month instead of worrying when they're on the phone with you, uh, wondering how long it's taking because they hear the meter running in their head, right? So, and the third part is just the advent of social media and the web. You know, more new clients are going to find you by a Google search than are going to walk into your lobby. So the web is your new lobby. And what does your social media profile say about you? Uh, if you Google yourself or your company, uh, do the pictures and images and stories come up that you really want? And Hector, we talked about this last time. <laughs> so the picture of me drinking a, a CPA IPA, which is on my Facebook page, and somebody looking up something about me, uh, that picture is going to come up. And is that the professional uh, representation that I want out there? Probably not, um, but it is who I am. But you know, look at your social profile, and hey, if if you're uh, trying to grow your firm and attract new new prospects, and the only pictures on the internet about you are from your frat parties in college, you might not be attracting the right clients that you want. So go up there and show your social profile. If somebody searches you, uh, you're get, you're getting a good representation of your professional self and not just your personal self. And, and the way that Intuit thinks about it is that a lot of companies are out there showing these warning signs, but we're trying to uh, continue our partnership with the accountants and make sure that we are helping them along the way to become a firm in the future today and giving them the steps and the resources that you need uh, so that you can say, hey, yeah, Chris, I agree with you, but where do I start, right? So if you go to firmofthefuture.com, we've created this website that has a ton of resources. We've got articles from Michelle and Hector, uh, myself, and, and Darren Root and Stacey Kilda and all the media uh, and all the influencers in the industry on how to become a trusted advisor how to think about value pricing, how to use social media to your advantage to grow, uh, how to move to the cloud. So you got this step-by-step -step opportunity uh, to make those baby steps and then eventually get more comfortable with all those things and then pretty soon you're, you're going like gangbusters and you're competitively set up uh, for the future and you're attracting clients like never before. The, um, the other aspect of it, and, and uh, I thought you'd ask since you, you submitted a video, Hector, was uh, we, had, we had a contest because 
we could talk about the benefits like I just went through, but it's so much more impactful to hear from a peer of yours, of somebody who's already doing these things and the success that they're having. So uh, we had a Firm of the Future video contest where folks could uh, come to uh, our website, submit a short video. Yep, you pulled it up right there. Uh, the contest is closed, unfortunately, but I just want to let you know that you know we received dozens and dozens of videos, and, and this is great. You know, you, you say, hey, submit a video about how you're a firm of the future, and you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, and we got such great creative uh, videos, including yours, Edgar. Um, but one, I mean, we got a rap video. We got this great video showing, you know, accounting from the past, where just you know. Somebody had a question, and they said, oh, my, you know, uh, I'll have to get back to you, back to the office. And the, the comparison to today, which was pull it up on your mobile phone, hey, I've got the answer right here. Uh, so just a lot of great stuff. We're going to announce the winners uh, at our QuickBooks Connect conference uh, and honor them. Uh, some may win a trip to Hawaii. We're going to give some an office makeover. Everybody wins the top 20, wins a free trip to San Jose to QuickBooks Connect. So, uh, but the key is you know, folks who aren't sure can go and watch these videos. And they can see that their peers are having tremendous success by taking these steps to become future ready. Hey, Chris, um, there was a question here that I really liked, but I, I have a feeling that you're going to say we'll, we'll dedicate a different webinar for that because the answer is going to be maybe many layers deep. One person's asking about the decision of getting rid of Quicken. <laughs> and I assume that this is not a one one sentence answer you can give, right? So there's a lot of depth to that and stuff like that. Yeah, I'll give, you, I'll give you two sentences. Uh, so my first job at Intuit in the year 2000 was the PR manager for Quicken. So I've been with Intuit 15 years, and uh, so when I heard that decision, it, it, it definitely, like a lot of folks, it was kind of like, how, how can you do that? Um, but when you think about it from a business perspective and Intuit's focus on really being the the uh, the engine behind small business success and really focusing on small businesses and accountants and doing the nation's taxes, which is being really TurboTax and our ProTax products in the U.S. and, and Canada. Um, Quicken doesn't really fit into that strategy. And uh, finding it a, a better home with, with Eric, uh, Eric Dunn is managing that right now, who is the employee number four at Intuit. Um, you know, so he knows the product better than anybody else. Um, but just finding that in a quick base and demand force and quick and just a better home uh, where they fit into a, another company's strategy better than it currently does with Intuit. And, and Intuit's growing so fast and innovating so fast and really focusing on that small business and, and tax uh, uh, strategies that we looked at things that don't quite fit and would either distract us or really wouldn't have our attention like they should and the customers wouldn't have the attention like, like we could give it. Uh, and it was a really hard decision. Uh, Brad Smith, our CEO, um, and Scott Cook uh, sent a couple of videos out to employees. They had an all hands. They had a, a big meeting with the with the entire 8,000 uh, employee uh, audience uh, earlier this week, and spent a lot of time going through the emotional fact of this decision and how it made sense. But sometimes uh, business decisions are tough, and and you know I, I think it's the right thing to do for the company, even though it's I'll always have a little piece of quick in my heart. Thank thank you for answering that, Chris. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that. That question actually just yeah. came in. Now, we, we're out of time for you, so we have to move to Michelle. So um, I know you wanted to make a big announcement today and um, and about about the QuickBooks Connect conference. What, what, what is that announcement, Chris? Yeah, real, real quick. So, uh, you know, just moving from Firm of the Future to QuickBooks Connect. So, you know, again, the uh, all most of these sessions at QuickBooks Connect will be set up around these three pillars. So you can come to QuickBooks Connect in San Jose and learn how to move to the cloud, learn how to use social media, You'll hear from Ron Baker. He's going to be on stage with Jim McGinnis, our, our leader, at the uh, kick, at the kick, kickoff on uh, the first day. And uh, but at the uh, end of day two, or the main day of QuickBooks Connect, uh, there'll be a concert. And last year we had Train, which was awesome. And uh, this year I am thrilled to announce that the Goo Goo Dolls have signed up, and we've got them to play at QuickBooks Connect in San Jose. So if you don't know the Goo Goo Dolls, look them up. Uh, they've got a ton of, of top 10 hits. They've sold 14 million albums. Uh, they're awesome. And, and uh, if last year was any indication, I, I had a good conversation with the, the lead guitarist of Train after the show, and I said, hey, you, know, you guys really brought it. You know, and there was only a couple thousand. You know, used to playing in front of you know, tens of thousands of people. You, know, you really showed up and, and brought your A game. And he said, I'll tell you what, we love playing these small shows because it's so intimate, and 
you know, you really only play to the first 10, 15 rows when you're playing at a concert anyway, because that's the feedback that you get. And uh, so we're looking for the Goo Goo Dolls to show up and, and just, you know, blow the walls off the place because they're, they're an awesome band. So get your tickets now, cookbooksconnect.com. You get Ron Baker plus the Goo Goo Dolls, and that's a double bill like you'll never see anywhere else. This year is supposed to be sold out, right, Chris? You're projecting to have four or 5,000 people, and it's, it's projecting yeah. to get yeah. sold out. Yeah, I'll tell you. Last year we were—it was the first year we ever we ever tried something at this scale, and we were sweating it out. We're like, you know, is anyone going to come? And and we had almost 5,000 folks there. And, and this year we're, we're actually based on the registrations that have come in so far and the pace that we're we're so far ahead of last year that we're actually having real discussions about. We have, we may have to cap the number of accountants that were, or attendees that show up, and how are we going to message that that the the show's sold out? So get get your tickets now, QuickBooksConnect.com. And you know, just for folks listening today, uh, we had early bird pricing that ended on August 21st. But uh, since I'm in charge of pricing, I'm gonna I'm gonna offer a, a promo code for everybody here, and it's QBC, just QuickBooks Connect, QBC Bird B I R D 15, like early bird. So QBC Bird 15. If you go in, get your ticket, that'll give you a $50 discount to get you back down to that early bird price. Um, that Right now, it's it's uh, not available uh, to anyone else, so definitely so go in and get that. Take, take advantage per of that, that motion. Per perfect, Chris. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to pass it to Michelle Long. Thank you very much oh, for that. That, that. that promo is, is for the three-day pass. We know accountants are going to want to come to put to all three days, so that's the price for the three-day ticket, which will get you down to three ninety nine. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right. All right. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. Thank you, and thank you for announcing the band here, Chris. That's very exciting. I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be great. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the Intuit Average Billing Rate Survey. Many of you know that they do this survey every few years, and they've done it for many, many years. I don't know how many years it's been going on now, but I'm excited to share with you guys a few of the results today, and we'll be going in deeper um, as we move along. But one of the first things that people want to know is, you know, how was the survey done and how many people replied and all that, who answered and stuff. So we had over, there were well over 1,300 people at least that had replied to this survey. So it was done online, you know, through the LinkedIn group, through Power Hour, through various social media. We were sharing it out, asking people to take the Intuit Average Billing Rate Survey. And we had lots of resp responses and replies. And it's helpful to know who is actually completing the survey. So here's a, a designation. People were asked, which of the following apply to you? Um, we had almost 60% that said they were a bookkeeper. We also had a little over 50% who identified as a certified pro advisor. Then, though, when you look at accountants, that number was less than 40. It was about 37 or 38%. And CPAs were a smaller percentage, maybe roughly 25%. So it was more heavily skewed towards bookkeepers who do have a lower billing rate normally than a CPA would, let's say, for example. So kind of keep that in mind when you're looking at the survey to kind of see how you compare to give you ideas of where your rate compares and things like that. Kind of look at this and keep that in mind when you're looking at some of the results as to where you compare. So when people were asked, what is your average hourly billing rate that you charge? I was actually surprised by this because it's a continuing problem that I've noticed. Um, I did the billing rate survey this year as well as a couple of years ago for Intuit. And it's an ongoing problem where we don't have people charging enough or a high enough rate. Look at how many people are charging $50 or less. I think that is absurd. We have got to get our billing rates above $50 an hour. 35% are charging $50 or less. And I think if you're a bookkeeper and you're getting certified as a pro advisor, you definitely should be having a higher rate than $50 or less. I mean, think about what plumbers and electricians are charging. Um, so that was one of the things that was surprising to me was how low I thought it was. Um, if you look though, uh, we do have, let's see, there's about 10, 12, about 18% that charge $100 or more. So that was kind of interesting, which is kind of what I would expect because you don't have as many CPAs that were answering this, and they tend to have the higher billing rates. A good majority of the people, if we were to average all this out, the average billing rates usually come around 75, 80 bucks an hour in the past, and I think this year would be pretty consistent with that. We're going to run some more numbers and do, do some more crunching to help give you a more specific hourly rate, but this can kind of help you see where you fall on this curve. 
So how do you know when it's time to raise your billing rate? First of all, the more experience you have, you should be increasing it. When you get certified, you should increase it. You should be increasing your billing rates every single year. Whether you're doing hourly billing or value pricing, you should be charging a larger amount once you get certified, you get more experience. Every year, hopefully, you're doing continuing education and you're learning more. We need to continue raising our billing rates um, as we're moving along. Another thing that was interesting was when we asked, what do you charge for QuickBooks troubleshooting and consulting? This gave higher numbers. If you noticed before, we didn't have that many in the 75 to 100 range, and we have a higher percentage charging more than 100 an hour. So QuickBooks troubleshooting and consulting is more specialized. It requires more expertise. So I think we've got higher billing rates when it comes to that, um, doing the QuickBooks stuff, as opposed to maybe just monthly bookkeeping. So I thought that was very interesting. And that's where, too, you know, doing these certifications, getting advanced certified, all of that can help you with increasing the rates that you're charging. But one of the things that I, I think is great, and I love to see this, is the hourly billing percentage. Although it's still high, we still have 66% that identified as primarily doing hourly billing. We need to get that number down, and it's continuing to go down. But think about it, I think it used to almost be you know, 80% or more where everybody was doing hourly billing. But what we have now is more and more accounting professionals are moving away from hourly billing because with tools, you know, like QuickBooks Online giving us that access and sharing the data with the client, downloading those transactions to where we're getting away from doing manual data entry, it just doesn't make sense to bill hourly anymore because we will make less money. And so more and more accounting professionals are moving to either a fixed fee or value pricing. And a fixed fee seems to be the higher percentage where we have 43% there. That's where you say, you know, what's my time and my cost and what do I think it's going to be and I'm going to charge them a fixed fee every month. As opposed to what's the value that we're providing without thinking about the time and cost that goes into providing the service, but what's the value. And that's where Ron Baker really helps us to start transitioning to value pricing and value billing. I was impressed to see that we've already got 17%. Primary, primary method is value pricing. So I think that's good. And I hope we continue to see the trend with the number of hourly billing going down and the number of people doing value pricing going up. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm so thrilled that we've got Ron Baker because he's a fabulous resource He's helping a lot of accounting professionals, accountants and bookkeepers everywhere to move away from the hourly billing, which is detrimental to us and our clients don't like it. They want to know what it's going to cost up front. And so it's an old, outdated method. I'm glad to see people moving away from that and uh, really thrilled that we have Ron Baker on here to talk some more about that. Just to let you know, though, we will have more in-depth details on the average billing rates in upcoming blog posts and upcoming webinars. We're just getting your feet wet now. We're going to break it down by, by regions and different you know, states and, and providence, provinces and, and things like that. So we'll be providing more details as we go along on these average billing rates, but just wanting to get you started and looking at some of this stuff. So it, it seems that there is a, definitely a strong movement for uh, – going to value billing and value pricing and 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 ron baker is definitely the expert on that do you think that intuit rate survey will still be useful uh in terms of knowing what the average rates are if the industry moves to value pricing what do you think about that i i think you're right i think it's going to be harder um to do some kind of average survey um but one of the things that we've started doing is asking about people practices are you emailing invoices are you accepting online payments um, and you know what type of apps are you using in your practice so I think we can the survey may be moving away from you know just billing rates to more practice management you know and best practices type of survey to see you know how accounting professionals are not just billing their clients but working with their clients and operating and things like that but you're right it's going to be much harder when it comes to value pricing to kind of say what the average is, uh, because that's so specific based on the client. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And thanks, Chris, for uh, enlightening us on the uh, QB Connect. I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be awesome. And folks, I want to talk to you about first principles, the firm of the future. 
This is something I've been passionate about for the last 15, 20 years. In fact, I wrote a book in 2003 called The Firm of the Future with a guy named Paul Dunn, who I'm sure some of you know. He's from Australia. And we really wanted to lay out what we thought, uh, you know, of the firm of knowledge workers would look like. What well, what does a knowledge firm look like, and how does that differ? And one of the things that you confront when you think about the future is you think about business models. Now, Andy Grove, founder of Intel, a guy who knows a little bit something about disruption and business models. Um, Intel, by the way, wants something like 100% of their revenue from products that didn't exist three years ago. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> Think about the innovation that that requires and the fact that you constantly have to cannibalize yourself. Because one of Andy Grove's famous lines is, if, if you're going to be cannibalized, better to dine with friends. And he said, disruptive threats come inherently not from new technology, but from new business models. You know, we all have access to technology, but if you think about the business model, that's where you see incredible disruption. So first, let me define what is a business model. A business model is how your firm creates value for your customer, and then how you capture a portion of that value. So creating value and capturing value. Now the capturing is obviously your pricing. That's your pricing, that's your marketing strategy, that's your purpose and all of that. But it's also about creating value and creating more value for your customers. And so, you know, moving to the cloud with Intuit is going to enable you to do faster things for your customers. Obviously you're going to be more efficient, but it's also going to allow you to spend more time climbing up the value curve and helping your customers look forward, helping them run their business rather than just constantly looking backwards at historical data. So, but business models are inherently very disruptive and you're seeing that now with the cloud. The cloud and all these apps and all these other types of technological innovation and, and how it changes the expectations of our customers that's inherently disruptive. Let me just give you two examples. Think about what Uber's doing to taxi cabs, right? Uber's not a transportation company. They don't own a single car. They are a software company that leverages technology and then leverages other people's assets to connect drivers with passengers, and they are decimating the taxi cab industry. Not only are customers leaving taxis, drivers are leaving and signing up with Uber. This is, in, this is incredibly disruptive. Think what Napster did to the music industry. That's another incredible business model disruption. And it took iTunes and Steve Jobs to save it because they basically came up with the iPod and iTunes. Think of Google Books. Google Books wants to have every single book published for free on Google Books that you can access. Now my publishers, John Wiley and Sons, they sued them. Now they lost, ended up settling out of court, and eventually, if not already, I think you can already access my books online for free. Now my books are $80 professional books, but the question is, do I want you to be able to access my books for free? Absolutely. Because my business model is not about a capturing value through the books, it's it's through other things, and but my business model conflicts with my publisher's business model. So the point is that business models are incredibly disruptive, and just think about the Google driverless car. I mean, this thing is only a few ways, a few years probably from being out there in the market, and this is going to be incredibly disruptive, not only to companies like Uber and buses and town cars, but even the automobile industry itself. And notice that a lot of disruption doesn't come from the industry itself. It always comes from the outside, and it always comes from the bottom up. And that's a real interesting you know, historical fact about business model change. Now, I want to focus on bookkeeper and accounting business models, uh, obviously, with this audience. But I should note that this applies to all professional firms. Think about our business model, folks. If I had you draw out a business model. How does the accounting firm, bookkeeping firm, create value for its customers? And then how does it capture value? My guess is you'd come up with an equation, something like this, where you say, okay, well, if we want to make revenue, we in a firm have three levers. We have 
people hours, right? We're leveraging people hours. We hire people, we bill them out at an hourly rate that Michelle just went through. And then we track the efficiency of those people, looking at billable hours, utilization rates, realization rates, all of the metrics that we keep based on uh, a, a bookkeeper or an accountant's efficiency. By the way, all those date back to the 1880s with a guy named Frederick Taylor. Now, let me ask you, has the world changed since the 1880s? And, and you can see where I'm going with this. What I'm arguing is our business model is more and more outdated. And, and then, of course, the last component is the hourly rate, right? We have an hourly rate, and of course, as you, as you grow and you get older, uh, you get more experienced, you learn more, you become certified in QuickBooks, whatever it might be, pro advisor, uh, your hourly rate climbs up every year. If you look at this business model, there's a common theme here. It's all denominated in time. In other words, this business model can be summed up in we sell time. Now, this is something that David Maester, a retired Harvard, Harvard professor, he used to specialize in professional firms. He wrote a book, and many of you have probably read it. It's a famous book called Managing the Professional Firm, and where basically he lays out this equation. His is a little bit more detailed, but it's the essence of it. And I really wanted to replace his thinking because I thought it was completely outdated. Let me just show you the guy who's responsible for both the timesheet and the billable hour. And it's Reginald Heber Smith. He was the first professional firm that we know of in the world to introduce both the billable hour and the timesheet simultaneously into his law firm in Boston, Massachusetts. He was a Harvard, a Harvard grad, Harvard Law School grad. He wrote a book about this in the 30s that was so popular, the a it was a series of articles, the ABA printed it into a book. I had to buy it off eBay for 275 bucks. This guy was way ahead of his time, and he was preaching the billable hour and the timesheet back in 1919. It took the law profession 30 years to adopt it. It took us about another 20 years in the accounting profession to adopt it. But again, folks, my question, has the world changed since 1919? We're coming up on a 100-year anniversary of this business model and I'm arguing that it is completely suboptimal, antiquated, and it has nothing to do with the, the fact that we're knowledge workers living and operating in a knowledge economy. Most of the metrics we use to track efficiency came out of the industrial era, out of steel mills. You're not working in steel mills. You're in a knowledge environment. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you four assertions that I think and I don't expect you to agree with them, I just want you to think with me, not, not like me, but, but think you must, because I think if you follow these four assertions, if they're logical, then they lead you to a completely different business model, which, which we'll emerge with when we're done with these four assertions. And they're very simple, and they're very commonsensical, and there's a ton of empirical evidence to back them all up. So let me give you the first one. Growth without profit is perilous. How many companies, how many small businesses have you seen grow into bankruptcy. Have you ever had a restaurant client that maybe opened up a second location, took on more debt, hired more people, grew their overhead, and went bankrupt? Even though the first location might have been very popular, had lines outside, we see this all the time. Profit, as Peter Drucker said, is the price we pay for tomorrow. It funds tomorrow. We've got to have profit. So you can't just have top-line growth. And the problem with that old business model is it makes every dollar look like it's a good dollar, right? As long as we put revenue on the top line, because our costs are fixed mostly in a professional firm, then a lot of it drops to the bottom line. I mean, I was taught when I was at Pete Mark, a then big eight accounting firm, that a professional firm is top line driven. Because our costs are fixed, the more we put on the top line, the more it drops to the bottom line. The problem with that logic, and it's called the market share myth, by the way, the problem with that logic is, not all customers are good. Not all customers are good fit. Not every dollar is good. You know, the old joke about the accountants never met a billable hour he didn't like. So growth without profit is perilous. And this led me to coin a law in this book, The Firm of the Future, that I wrote called Baker's Law that is bad customers drive out good customers. Now, this is self-evident. Every audience I ask, do you agree with this? Everybody raises their hand. We all know bad customers are pain. They require a disproportionate amount of resources, disproportionate amount of attention. By the way, there are a disproportionate amount of liability risk as well. Um, and we spend too much time over-servicing bad customers. And 
if we do that, we're putting our best customers at risk. <clears throat> so Baker's Law basically says, look, you, you've got to make sure that you only devote so much capacity to your C, your C customers and give more capacity, allocate more capacity, and reserve more capacity, just like airlines and host hotels do, for your best customers. And that's why it's not about growth. It's really about profit. You know, what they say is revenue is vanity, but profit is sanity, and, and that is really true. The second assertion I'm going to make to you is a non-rival asset has got more rep leverage than a rival asset. Now, th these are economics terms, but this is a really cool concept I think you're going to see. Um, when an economist talks about a rival asset, it's like an airplane. You know, if an airline buys an airplane, they assign that airplane to a route. Well, that's a rival asset. It can only fly that one route. And if it's flying that route, it obviously can't fly another route. But a non-rival asset like knowledge, like we trade in as accountants and bookkeepers, knowledge is a non-rival asset because if I give you knowledge today, now you have it, but guess what? I still have it. I didn't lose it when I gave it to you. In other words, it can be at more places at one time. You can take that idea or that knowledge, you can expand on it, improve on it, test it, create wealth in your own firm, and then it might even find its way back to me from you somehow, someday, maybe in a presentation, a book, whatever. And that's a non-rival asset because it can be at more in more in more than one place at one time. That's really what we're selling, is we're selling the intellectual capital, the non-rival asset, and that's got far more leverage than a billable hour. Think about a billable hour. It's a rival asset. The hour that we spend on this webinar, you can't be billing, in, unless you can multitask, and none of us can because the human brain just sucks at multitasking. So I much rather have a business that's based on a non-rival asset then the business is based on a rival asset. Well, guess what? We have that because we're knowledge workers. The hourly billing rate doesn't account for that, and that's its big problem. And what this also means is that knowledge is the ultimate form of wealth. As my, as my mentor, George Gilder, loves to say, wealth is knowledge, and knowledge is wealth, but also growth is learning. So as you learn more, as you get take more CPE, you get certified in these different things, maybe you get some credentials behind your name in different areas or you specialize, that's all going to create more wealth for your customers and in turn allow you to capture a higher share of wealth. Here's a very interesting way to think about this concept that wealth is knowledge, is, is what uh, Thomas Sowell says. The caveman had the same natural resources as we did, folks but they didn't have the same standard of living because they didn't have the same level of knowledge that we have because we have the knowledge that can use that resource like oil under the ground right oil under the ground was useless until we invented the combustion engine and if we ever find a replacement for oil it's going to go back to being useless right so knowledge is really where it's at and we live and operate in a knowledge economy and everybody on this call all 500 and some odd of you are knowledge workers you're not factory workers, you're not industrial workers, you're not service workers, you're knowledge workers, you work with your mind. And the process of the mind cannot be measured in efficiency terms like, like of somebody working on an auto factory line. Uh, so here's my third assertion to you, is that effectiveness is what creates a competitive advantage. Efficiency is a table stake. And you, you know, I, I know Hector, you know this, and Michelle, you probably do too. We, we've been having a discussion <laughs> on, on the Facebook uh, Power Hour uh, page uh, over this whole issue of, of timesheets and, and measuring efficiency and productivity. And let me just say, it, measuring the productivity of a knowledge worker is almost futile. Nobel Prize economists can't figure out how to do it because knowledge work takes place in the mind. It's an iterative process. It's not like putting tires on an assembly line on cars that pass by you. You can sit in front of your computer and look completely productive, but being but be completely zoned out. Or you could be in the zone and be a hundred times more creative and coming up with million dollar ideas in flashes of brilliance, like maybe driving in the car even or standing in the shower. This is very hard to apply these 1880 metrics to knowledge workers, which is by the way, which leads to another very important conclusion with this, but let me just show you what I mean by this. Think about going to a Ritz-Carl 
a Ritz Carlton as opposed to any other hotel. You go up to any other hotel, say, and you ask them, you know, where's so and so ballroom, and they'll probably pull out a map and they'll they'll circle where you are in the lobby and then they'll give you the directions on how to get to the ballroom. Now that's incredibly efficient because they can do that really quick and they can move on to the next guest. Very efficient. Efficiency experts would love that. What would Rich Carlton do if you ask anybody on that property, I don't care if it's a maid, a bellman, anybody, anybody, you say, where's the ballroom? They'll escort you there. Now folks, that's not efficient, but it is highly effective. And it's a effectiveness that creates competitive differentiation. Efficiency is a table stake. You can't gain any, any competitive advantage from efficiency, none. You know why? Because your competitors can do it too. Your competitors can go into the cloud. They have access to all these apps, all the technology, all the efficiency. They're also climbing down a learning curve that increases efficiency of knowledge workers every day. You know you're going to be more efficient doing your hundredth tax return than your first three. And this is the, this is a learning curve. This is normal human behavior. The, the, the heart surgeon is going to be more efficient with his hundredth surgery than his first. So, but but true competitive advantage is based on effectiveness, which is defined as doing the right thing. Efficiency is just a ratio. It's just some type of outputs divided by inputs. In our case, that's billable hours, realization, utilization. Efficiency is always a ratio. And what I'm positing to you is ratios and efficiency and knowledge work are irrelevant. I don't want an efficient surgeon. I want an effective surgeon. There is an enormous difference. Let me give you an example. Walt Disney, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, over one million hand-drawn animated cells. Not very efficient, right? Especially when your whole studio's in debt to, to make this film. It's over budget. It's running way behind. Had an efficiency expert come into Walt Disney, they would have said, hey, Walt, why don't you knock out three of the dwarfs? Snow White and the Four Dwarfs. Well, you know what? That wouldn't be as effective. The Two Little Pigs just doesn't have the same ring to it. So, folks, this is why you've got to get off the idea of efficiency. Stop worrying about it. Efficiency is going to take care of itself. And what matters in our business is relationships. And you know what? Relationships, you, you don't want to be efficient. What does it mean to have an efficient marriage? <laughs> right? What? What's that mean to say my, my marriage is efficient? I mean, we can be efficient with things, but we have to be effective with people. And developing relationships and strengthening them can't be done looking at clocks. That's why the whole mentality of both the billable hour, but more severely, the timesheet is so wrong. And as Jules Goddard said, we interviewed him on our radio show, and I love this line, strategy is the rare and precious skill of staying one step ahead of the need to be efficient. If you look at the most innovative companies, I would put Intuit in that basket, I'd put Intel in that basket, Apple in that basket, Zappos, all, these are not the most efficient companies in the world. Companies aren't paid to be efficient. You're created to create wealth. And in our case, that means built on relationships. And relationships can't be efficient with people, only with things. So you've got to strive to be worried and, and more concerned about effectiveness which is doing the right thing, irrespective of how long something takes. It doesn't matter. Do what's right. Do the right thing. Keep your customer happy and, happy and constantly develop the relationship. And that's what matters. And that's why, and, and I'll just say this now, uh, the firm in the future does not have timesheets. There's no role for timesheets in the firm of the future, period, end of sentence. The billable hour is not the problem. The timesheet is the real cancer. It's the timesheet that keeps us mired in the mentality that time is either value or even cost. It's neither. Time is a constraint. All businesses are subject to the constraint of time. Indeed, all living things are subject to the constraint of time. Therefore, it's a constant. Therefore, it's not something we can manage. <laughs> it, it, it's a constant, and it has no place in the firm of knowledge workers, none whatsoever. And, and you'll see that when you see what the new business model looks like. So my last assertion to you is that value pricing is superior to hourly billing for capturing value. 
for reasons that I think a lot of you already know based on the statistics that Michelle just showed about how many people are already doing value pricing. Now, you know, you have to take those surveys with a grain of salt, and I do because they're not scientific, they're not scientifically scientifically constructed, they're not a random sample, but they do give us a vector of what firms are doing. And it is encouraging to see the number of firms doing real value pricing uh, grow every single year. And that's what we see in the CPA world too, as, as well as every other professional industry. But one of the reasons why pricing is so important relative to anything else your firm can do is, is based on a couple studies that pricers love to show, and this has been replicated many times, but this shows you what happens if you have a 1% change in these various things. For example, and this is, by the way, for middle-sized manufacturers, and it's two studies by two consulting firms. If you cut your fixed cost by 1%, this is the impact on profit. If you increase your revenue, that's your impact on profit. Cut your variable cost. But look what happens when you increase your price by 1% with no change in demand. You get a 7 to 11% jump in profit. Now, what's interesting about this is it dwarfs the effects on profit of anything else you can do, including rainmaking, including cutting costs, and including being efficient. This is why I'm so unconcerned about your efficiency. I could care less. I'm much more concerned about you adding more value, which that and that means strengthening the relationship, adding to the relationship, and putting in the time necessary to figure out how you can help your customers and innovation and R&D and all of these things and if you price it right the profits are more than going to take care of themselves pricing has a bigger impact on your bottom line than rainmaking I mean you can go out and rain make all you want bring in new clients but if you bring them in at the wrong price you've just added layers of mediocrity to your firm so to compute your own 1% effect by the way just take 1% of your firm's revenue divide it by your profit and that will show you the effect of a 1% increase in price we're talking about going from $100 to $101 not in hourly rates I'm talking about price to the customer fixed price to the customer if there was no change in demand you'll see that if you had a 5, 10, 15% pricing power increase, you could have dramatic impact on your bottom line. So when people say a firm of the future needs to work smarter and not harder, this is what, I mean, this is the best way to do it, is you got to put more thought and creativity and innovation into pricing because that's the best way to work smarter because that's really leveraging uh, your knowledge and the value that you're creating so you make sure you capture a fair portion of it. So these four assertions. Now, again, I don't expect you to agree with all of them. I know some of them are, are you know, a lot of people have, especially with number three. But I, I can tell you empirically that the firms that have done this, you know, <laughs> firms of the future that we deal with don't have timesheets, and none of them have gone back. I mean, they just, you know, once you get rid of that thing, because that thing is an absolute crutch. You constantly use it to measure the efficiency of your people. You constantly use it to check your pricing. But but it doesn't answer those questions. To run your firm with timesheets is the equivalent of timing your cookies with your smoke alarm. And at QB Connect, I'm actually doing a session on what replaces the timesheet. There's very specific things that replace it. But the point is they're far superior for knowledge workers because they actually help us improve future performance. Timesheets don't help you improve future performance. That's one of their big problems. We spend all this time filling them out, worrying about them, processing them, but they don't help us improve actual performance. Our replacements do. So if you, if you look at those four assertions, then you're left with the business model that says, we're going to start with profit. And what I mean by this is the customer's profit, because every time the customer uses you and pays you, they also make a profit. So what I'm trying to maximize here is the customer's lifetime profit over their value. You know, we always talk about what's the lifetime value of a customer, but let me ask you a better question. What's the lifetime value of your firm to your customers? I think that's a much better question. That's what we're talking about when, when we say profit up here. And you're doing that not by leveraging hours. You can't leverage time. You're doing it by leveraging intellectual capital. And because that's a non-rival asset that can be at more places at once, that's far more, that opens up many more possibilities to create wealth. We're worried about effectiveness, not efficiency, and we no longer have hourly rates. We have 
uh, a price. You know, businesses don't have hourly rates; they have prices, right? No airline tries to charge you four dollars a minute for your flight. You you wouldn't fly them. You demand a fixed price. In fact, we we don't buy anything where we don't know the price up front. And so if you look at this business model, it basically says our customers buy transformations. Now, this is a pretty high level look at your business model, folks, but like Peter Drucker says, you know, don't solve problems, pursue opportunities. If you really want to have a dramatic change on your practice, you can't just tinker around the edges with efficiency gains here and there. I mean, you know, that just doesn't do it. it it's not going to help the taxi cabs to increase their efficiency by 5% because Uber's going to take them out. And if somebody else is entering your market and, and, and gaining the lion's share of the wealth, efficiency no longer matters. What matters is effectiveness and creating competitive differentiation and realizing that your, your team are knowledge workers. They're not assets. They're not resources. They own the means of production in their heads. And you've got to leverage that intellectual capital. That is what creates wealth for your customers. And so you can sell your customers outcomes that they that they really care about and that can dramatically change their life. This is how you can get a hold of me, and I'll, I'll turn it back to Hector. But folks, I'm easily accessible. You can email me. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm one of the LinkedIn blog influencer bloggers, and I also do a radio show on Voice America every Friday where we talk about all these issues and more. The knowledge economy, professional firms, pricing, all of that stuff is up there, and you can find more on that at the soul of enterprise.com. You can listen to our old shows. Uh, you can also find tons of information, including trailblazer case studies at verisage.com. And those trailblazer case studies are firms. To be a trailblazer, you have to do you have to have three requirements: 100% value pricing, where you price the customer, not the service. No timesheets, none, and 100% value guarantee to your customers, meaning if they're not satisfied for whatever reason, uh, they only pay for the value they think you received. That is my definition, along with this business model of what a firm of the future looks like. So Hector, with that, I'll turn it back to you. Wow, Ron. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I'm extremely happy and proud that you wanted to uh, be, be, be part of this with us. And I, and I hope that that we can have you later on in the future. There, there are many other conversations we uh, we would like to have with you, um, uh, mostly because uh, there are some questions here that I don't think we're going to be able to answer. Um, so some of them, I would say, uh, the main biggest question is, what is the difference between value building and value pricing? Can you answer that in 30 seconds? Yes. Bill, folks, there's no such thing as value billing. I'm sorry. Uh, there just isn't. It's a misnomer. Billing takes place in arrears after the work has been done. That's no different than hourly billing. Pricing takes place up front before the work is done. And what we mean by value pricing is pricing the customer, not the service. We're not talking about a menu price here like a McDonald's. We're talking about you customize both options and prices for one customer at a time for every single customer. Okay, awesome. Um, the other piece, I wanna make a recommendation to everybody here, go to your iPhone, go to the podcast app, whatever it's called, and search The Soul of Enterprise, subscribe to the podcast. You can you can uh, binge listen <laughs> uh, if you want to. There, there, there's about 52 episodes, 50 something episodes because it's been it's been a, just over a year, right, Ron? Um, right. Or, or you can listen to them live. I'm telling you, they're truly transformative. The value pricing. And what I'm saying is the the journey for for the for for the the better business model, not just the pricing, but the, the better business model has a lot of components. There's psychological components. There's economic components. Um, there's behavioral components. There's there's rationality by by our employees, by our by our customers. There's corporate culture. There are so many moving parts to be able to transform your practice. And I I'm, I don't want to say that I have transformed my practice, but I am in this journey myself. And what I love about the Soul of Enterprise, uh, the podcast, is that it's it's not about accounting. It's not about lawyers. It's not about accountants. It's not about the cloud. It's about everything that Ron deems as important. And a lot of it has to do with transforming your practice. Not everything. You know, we do talk about some some books that have nothing to do with 
uh, what we do every day, you know, like the expertology stuff that you did last week. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But, you know, but but there's an episode that I strong, I recommend everybody, if you want to start with an episode, I would listen to one called uh, Homer and Spock or Homer versus Spock, where it talks about the rationality and irrationality of, of customers. And and I'm telling you, cust- the customer psychology and rationality, it's it's 90% of your marketing and your business execution. If you understand what the customer wants, what they need, how they perceive everything, you you are much likely to 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 raise your prices, change the way you work and transform your practice as it is. So Ron again, thank you very much and and um and and continue the con- if you if you if you're part of the Facebook group. Let's continue the conversation there. Please join the Facebook group. Absolutely. Ask ask Ron some questions there, and I'm sure he'll be able to answer them as candidly as as he has and conflictive <laughs> and and vehement, right? As, as he does, and and he believes in his cause, and 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 I'm sure that at some point in the future we all will as well. Thank you. All right. So I'm making the shift to um the our original sponsor that was going to do a demo was Practice Ignition which is a, a, a proposal and engagement automation management app. I'm going to do a quick preview of it here uh, because I want to encourage you to set up a trial. So uh, 45 days from now, uh, on October 15th, when we do a live demo in QB Power Hour, then we can close the loop and decide. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually just recently implemented that in my firm as well. So Practice Ignition, which is practiceignition.com, um, it's an app that allows you to create engagement letters you can have a multiple templates depending on the type of the work. You can send it to your client. They can digitally sign it. There's a permanent record, and the client has a copy of, of that engagement uh, next to each invoice, right? So the, there's n- never doubts about what the scope of work was and what the limitation was. You can do custom pricing for projects, or you can have specific types of jobs that have consistent pricing. So it's a really interesting and fast tool to to build engagements, get them accepted, and um, and what they're building, uh, they're, they're also building is the internal tracking and communication of your with your client and your team members, and the automated payment whenever you set up. Um, payment terms for fixed rate projects. So I'll show you real quick. Basically, you you will have multiple templates in there. Again, this is not meant to be just this is just a teaser. Um, you, you choose your client, you choose the the specific uh, scope of work that you're doing. The system will go ahead and email your client the pricing summary. It will send them an engagement letter. If you want to call it fixed price agreement, if you're a fan of, of Ron Baker, or what Ron Baker talks about not the engagement letter, but the fixed price agreement. Um, you can have your pr- fixed price agreement there with all the scope of work limitations, what you do, what you won't do, all your service guarantees. And you can manage all your active proposals in, in a single page and look at the, it looks a lot like QBO, obviously. It's compatible with quick books online. So go to practiceignition.com, set up a trial. Anybody can set up a two-week trial. However, I asked them to extend the trial all the way to October 15th to give people a chance to both test it and see it with a live demonstration we're going to do in QB Power Hour on 1015, where we'll talk about engagement letters. So we're going to have an episode just about engagement letters and scope of work and the type of language that we should have in these documents and these contracts for client onboarding. So if you contact Max, there's the the link down there in the bottom um, to set up a a, a private demo if you want. But if you use the coupon code QB Power Hour, the demo will be extended all the way to 45 days from now. So that's going to give you a chance to test it and then uh, watch the, the live demo. All right. So mark your calendars uh, for the next uh, Power Hours. Um, next week is What's New with QuickBooks 2016. We're, we're hoping that Intuit will release it by Tuesday or Wednesday so we can have it by Thursday and re- talk about it. The week after, we'll do custom reporting in QuickBooks. We'll explore all sorts of custom reports. So that's going to be a, a in-product uh, episode. Uh, then on 924, we're going to have a special all about an app called Spotlight Reporting. So we'll go really in depth about custom reports with this app. Then we'll do nonprofits on October 1st. And then on October 15th, as I mentioned, we're gonna do client onboarding, uh, project management and engagement letter. And we'll do a demo with practice ignition. On 1029, we'll have AR management in QuickBooks. And that is as much as I can plan out uh, for now. So uh, Ron, I think you're still on. If you wanna answer another question, if you don't mind. Sure, Um, sure. So this is more, I think there's a lot of semantic issues here. So a lot of people are, are, are this whole 
killing the timesheet concept, I think is driving people towards a different thinking model. People are worried about the timesheet being killed, but there's a lot of argument about what about my hourly employees that I need to meet payroll. So I think it's important to clarify that when you're talking about getting rid of the timesheet, you're not talking about tracking people's paycheck hours. We're talking about tracking our billable hours, correct? Right. I'm not, yeah, if you're paying your people hourly, which I know some folks do, um, no problem logging, you know, I work six, eight, ten, whatever hours today. We're talking about the six minute, ten minute timesheet, you know, per job um, that needs to go. Okay. And, um, and, and so on, on that same concept, so some people are here and some fans of value pricing and fans of yours, um, uh, they're saying, listen, I still use internal timesheets and I track the jobs that they're working on because I want to know my profitability per job or I want to know if my client, my employees are being efficient. I, I, I assume but what he means by that is my, my goal is that he takes only eight hours to do this job and I want to make sure if it takes more than eight that I'm reprimanding him for it and that what what's what's your take on that? Using timesheets for internal yeah. job costing. Don't tell you tell, timesheets don't tell you if knowledge workers are efficient for the reasons I talked about. Knowledge workers work in their minds, not you know you have to make judgments about their work. I mean, I can I can meet your budget, but what if my work is substandard? What if I'm a complete hack? What if I pissed off your client because I have bad relationship skills or your or fellow team members? These are all judgments. They're not measurements. We as accountants, I know we love measurements because that's what we do, but we need to realize that when it comes to relationships and people, team members, it's all about judgments. You know, you don't you don't measure another accountant's um, productivity. You judge it. Are they effective? What's their customer service ethic? What's their professionalism? These things can't be measured any more than communication skills can be measured. They have to be judged and experienced. And timesheets are the ultimate illusion of control. They think you think they're giving you control. And this idea that timesheets allocate costs so you can figure out profitability by job, it's kind of absurd. I mean, for example, if you have office rent and you're in a 15, 10-year, 5-year lease, I don't care how you allocate that rent. You're paying it. <laughs> so it's a fixed cost. So the allocation becomes superfluous. What matters is the price to the customer and how can you create more value so you can charge a higher price. And I want you to spend more time focusing on that than looking at timesheets you know, backwards and focusing on the past. They don't help us improve. They're an enormous bureaucracy that adds zero value to your customer. And they are the ultimate illusion of control. And you're better off without them. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have replacements for them. We do. And that's what I'll talk about at QBC. But this idea that you need them is, is superfluous. I mean, you don't need them if you're doing these other things correctly. Right, right. And I want to put, let me, let me put your, your page again. Again, if, if you are still here and there's still, it's past the hour and we still have 450 people here, that means that there's a lot of interest on, on your stuff, Ron. You know, uh, if I, I know Ron, you don't answer every question via email, but I know Ron, you're pretty accessible. So, you know, try to access Ron. He is a, is a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure at some point, you know, Ron would, if we, we had to do a private consultation or something, if you want to go really deep, but, but he does answer questions via email really quick. Um, a lot of people are having issues with this whole timesheet situation. You know, it's, it's hard to let go. Uh, whoops, I, 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 moved, I moved the slide by mistake. And the other uh, the problem that we have is transition. A lot of people on this call here are QuickBooks consultants. That means that they probably started as a bookkeeper, right? Started as a bookkeeper, charging 20, 25, 30 dollars an hour, as Michelle was saying, and they're evolving into technologists, right? So, so we're going through this very difficult transition of I have a lot of clients that I've been raising prices from 25 to 75 or from 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 50 to 100, and now we're going to move to value pricing, which which a lot of us feel that is even higher price. So, in your experience of of helping smaller firms that are transitioning their hourly clients that are at a lower rate into value pricing. Do you have a quick tip on that and then I'll let you go. 
Yeah, no, uh, uh, it can be done. You can you can start this. This is done one customer at a time, so it's not something that you know you go back and cannonball into the pool and do do it all at once. You do it one customer at a time, and and start wherever you're most comfortable. If that's with your existing customers, then start there. If that's with new customers that come into you, start there. It doesn't matter. I've seen it work tremendously both ways. But lots of small firms do this. I mean, I, I mentor a group up in Canada for the last three years. We're about to go into our fourth called the Black Swans. They're all smaller bookkeeping firms. Some of them are sole proprietors. Some of them have up to 10 or 12 employees. They've all made this transition, all 18 of them. Every single one of them has gone 100% value pricing, and every single one of them has gotten rid of timesheets. Every single one of them has increased not only their top line, but also their bottom line, and by the way, shrunk the number of customers they have. They do this all with less customers. So it, it's all it's all wrapped up in your business model and your strategy. But folks, it can be done. It is being done by firms of all sizes. Th thank you so much, Ron. Absolutely fantastic. We'd love to have you again. We'd love to talk about some of the details about actually implementing this. If you go to YouTube and you search for Ron Baker into it, there's a four-part series that go that basically a summary of the implementing value pricing book. I recommend that. And as a last note, join our Facebook page. Continue the conversation. Uh, search QB Power Hour on Facebook. Thank you very much, and I will see you guys again next week. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks, Hector. Thanks, everyone.